my name is not Daniel of the schedule suggests, but Mario. I work at Bitmovin on the video player development team, where um, oh, thank you, <laughs> where I'm responsible for the video player development, but also for our open source UI framework and our release testing framework. And today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about audio, more specifically about ambisonic audio and the web audio API, and. Like, I think that audio is usually not getting the attention it deserves because I think it's pretty important. Like, a movie without audio would be quite boring. And to show you just how less attention it gets, I have, like, created a little example for you. You might be familiar with this image. Um, and there's lots of video uh, references on there. <laughs> And only down here, there are those two lonely little headphones, the only reference at audio. So today's talk is like, I can't remember the word now, but uh, dedicated to these lonely little headphones here. <laughs> um, you're probably all familiar with how 360 degree video is working. There's a camera with usually multiple lenses. The feeds are stitched together to form a single frame. This frame is then projected onto some kind of 3D body in which we can rotate our hands, uh, our heads and uh, look into different directions. But how does the audio path look like? Like traditionally, a video would have a stereo audio track uh, recorded with two microphones. And when we turn our head into in the virtual space, the audio field doesn't uh, turn with us. And that's a not really great experience. Also, another problem with stereo over headphones is that stereo sound is usually located inside the head, and we want to create the impression that it's coming from the outside and we are right there in the middle of the scene. So the question is, how can we uh, create or encode such spatial audio that carries directional information, and how can we play it back as a stereo stream over headphones to create an immersive experience? Uh, as far as recording is concerned, uh, the most widely used uh, microphone pattern is the omnidirectional microphone. It records sounds from every direction. Then we have the cardioid, it records sounds only from the front. And the bidirectional microphone recording from the front and back, but not from the sides. So it's basically recording a pressure gradient on an axis. And there's a few more patterns, but they are not important right now. The point is that all these microphones, they produce a one-dimensional uh, signal, and from this we cannot extract which part of the signal comes from which direction. Um, yeah, so to create a three-dimensional capture of the sound scene, we need to get a little bit more fancy and con like combine them in some way. And when we imagine a three-dimensional space, we can now um, take bidirectional microphones for every axis, then add an omnidirectional channel that contains everything, and from these we can, by scaling and subtraction and addition, extract which audio e information came from which direction. And the important point when recording or creating such uh, channels is that they need to be uh, recorded from the exact uh, same point in space, which is not a problem in a virtual environment like a digital audio workstation, but with a field recording, it's rather like not really easy to put four physical microphones in the same place. So uh, as a solution for this problem, the tetrahedral microphone was invented specifically for ambisonic recording, and it uses four cardioid capsules that also capture like the whole sound sphere, and it can be easily converted to the format we've just seen before. And that brings us directly to ambisonics. Mm, ambisonics are a way to capture and transport full spheres around sound that captures directions all around the listener, not just, for example, on the horizontal plane like traditional surround sound does. And it does that by uh, consisting of a number of spherical harmonic signals. Uh, ambisonics has been invented in the 70s, so most trademarks and patents have already expired, and it's basically free to use. Uh, we already know those four. 
audio channels that we can see here, they are what's called first order ambisonics and within the 3D space that they um, make up, we can now uh, position all kinds of microphone patterns pointing in all kinds of directions and sample the audio coming from this direction. Uh, adding spherical harmonics of higher orders gives us what's called higher order ambisonics and the higher the order gets, the better is the uh, directional resolution. And the nice thing about ambisonics is that it's quite flexible. For example, we can only take uh, channels that cover the horizontal plane and get horizontal uh, surround sound. Or we can combine it and, for example, take first order height information combined with, with, first or, uh, with third order horizontal information. So let that's pretty flexible for many use cases and gives opportunities to uh, save data. Okay. Uh, this is an example on how the directionality increases, uh, first order versus third order, and the energy distribution. And you can clearly see third order is much more directed than the first order. And to play back ambisonic audio, we need to decode it. And for that, we need to know the target speaker setup. And decoding works pretty well for regular speaker setups. It is working for irregular uh, setups like this 5.1 setup here. And of course, it's working for headphones too, because that's just another uh, regular speaker setup. Uh, there's still one problem, though, which I already mentioned, that we get a plain stereo stream out of there, which we locate inside our head. So to improve the system and make it seem coming from the outside, we actually need to take a look at how we localize sound. But to conclude the ambisonics topic, if this uh, technology is so awesome and everything, the question arises, why is it not widely used? And I've been searching the internet a lot to uh, find out what's going on there. And by far the best answer that I found was on the Ambisonic surround sound FAQ, and it says, because it's British. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure if this, is, if this is the correct answer. Another explanation might be that back when it was invented, audio processing was done analog, which is pretty complicated. But nowadays, due to digital signal processing, it became much easier. Usage is actually on the rise. For example, Google and Facebook are using it already for their VR videos, like VLC3 will also support ambisonic audio. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at how we localize sound. Um, sidewards localization works like this. We imagine a sound coming from the right, then it arrives at the near ear earlier than at the far ear, which is a time difference, and this clue can be used by our brain to localize where it comes from. A second clue is the level difference, because our head, like it shadows the far ear and the level drops of the audio, which is the second clue that we use for side words. But it does not help us to know if a sound is coming from the front or the back or top or bottom. So for this, we actually use these things here attached on our heads, called the pinna. And depending where a sound comes from, it gets reflected in different ways before it reaches the ear canal. These reflections, they change the frequency spectrum. And from this, our brain knows where a sound comes from. And these clues, they can actually be uh, captured and applied to an audio signal, and the function that does that is called the head-related transfer function. Um, on this picture here, that's not a secretly developed time machine, but it's actually a construction to measure these HRTFs. There's a guy sitting in the middle, he's wearing headphones. There's an array of speakers around him which emit uh, signals one by one, like impulses. Then this is like going around the guy, and what we end up with is a data set of HRTFs from all kinds of directions. And now if we have a sound and we want to create the impression that it's coming from a specific direction, look up the correct HRTF for this direction, which is basically a filter that we apply to the sound. And we, if we do that for both ears, 
left and right, we get what's called binaural playback. So putting everything together now to get 360 degree immersive VR audio, uh, we can do the following. We create an ambisonic recording, then we can rotate the audio sphere around our head, like depending on where we look to. Then we can position virtual speakers in the sound field, which works by placing virtual microphones. Then we apply HRTFs to the according directions of where the speakers are and mix it down to a stereo stream. And that's what binaural 3D audio is and what gives us the impression that we are right in there. And now that we roughly know how such a system can be implemented, let's get to the practical part, which is the web audio API. So a basic setup for uh, online streaming looks like this. There's an asset somewhere stored on the internet, which is then streamed to the user's browser, which the HTML media element uh, decodes and renders. The audio is then passed to the audio hardware and passed to the speakers. What the Web Audio API now adds for us is an object called the audio context, through which the audio is routed, where we get access to the decoded audio and means to uh, analyze and alter and filter, yeah, to modify it. Um, a closer look at the audio context, it basically consists of different nodes with different functions that can be chained or connected together, which form a graph through which the audio flows. And it always provides a destination node, which we can use to play back the audio, but we don't have to use it. For example, if we only wanted to like analyze the audio, we don't need to use the destination. Okay, and the simple example uh, looks like this. Down there is the HTML markup. It's simply a video element with a video and an audio stream. And then in JavaScript, we get a reference to the video element. We create a new audio context. From the context, we create a source element, which basically extracts us the audio information from the video element. Then we connect source to destination, and when we now play back the video, the audio flows through this audio context. Now, besides those two nodes that you've just seen, there's many more, like the gain node can be used to adjust the volume of a stream, or channel splitter node to split a multi-channel stream into separate mono streams. The merger does the opposite. Then there's the oscillator, which creates an oscillating signal, like a sine or a rectangle wave. And then there's many more of these. And to get a little bit more, or to take advantage of the Web Audio API, we can now insert a gain node, which is pretty simple. We just call create gain, get the gain node, then we connect the source to the gain node and the gain node to the destination. And then we can set the gain value to like 0 0.5, like here. Now we flow at the volume to 50%, basically. And the nice thing about the Web Audio API is that most of these parameters, they can actually be scheduled, uh, they can be animated, and they can also take output of other uh, nodes as input. Because like an audio stream is just a sequence of numbers, so it can be also used um, to sequentially alter the value. And so in this case, we can now replace the hard-coded value with an oscillator node that we set to a sine wave with 0.1 hertz. And if we now play back the video, like the audio volume goes up and down with the shape of the sine wave. OK. So practical considerations when using the audio API are basically that there's only a limited number of audio contexts uh, available. In Chrome, for example, it's six. So if you wanted to have a website with 10 video players on it that um, do audio processing, then you have to share the audio context between multiple players. Also, when using it, it's a good thing to get to know which uh, nodes are existing and use them as much as possible, because like native implementation are always much faster than a custom implementation that you can do in JavaScript, and in the future also offload it to a worker thread. But yeah, better to use what's already existing. 
Um, and now the question, how can ambisonic support be implemented in the Web Audio API? And here I made my life rather easy because there's already two very nice uh, libraries available, so there's no reason to implement that again. And both are basically a very, like a smartly built graph of pre-existing nodes, mainly gain nodes, uh, splitters and mergers, but also a few filters and convolvers. The actual implementation goes a little bit beyond this talk here. But the important thing is they work pretty well. I can recommend them both, and today we are treating them as a black box that we can insert into our audiograph. Practical considerations when uh, working with ambisonics are there's different kind of channel orderings and channel normalizations. So if you wanted to correctly um, decode an ambisonic stream, you need to know these. And for example, ACN, the ambisonic channel numbering, and the SN3D, which is the Schmidt semi something normalization, they are the de facto standard today. They are also required by YouTube, for example, and they're used by the MBX uh, file exchange format. Then some other issues, uh, mainly when working with higher order ambisonics, are that different browsers support different audio codecs with different number of channels. For example, in uh, Safari, you can only get up to six channels with AAC. In Chrome and Firefox, you can get up to eight channels. In Edge, I managed to decode 16 channels with WAVE, but that's not an option for online streaming. And another thing to consider is that different browsers decode the channels in a stream in different orders. So for example, AAC in Chrome and Firefox, they are sequentially um, decoded, and in Safari in some other order, which is kind of strange, but anyway, I've written a test page which you can open in your browser. It um, tests all file formats and number of channels and then the order of the outputs in case somebody is interested. Um, and yeah, now putting everything together that we have learned today, we can now successfully uh, implement ambisonics in an HTML5 video player. And which video players could we use for that? We need one that supports VR, which is, for example, VideoJS or JW player or Theo player or the BitMovin player. Then we also need access to the viewing direction, which JW player, I think, does not expose yet. But the guy who implemented it is sitting somewhere here, so if that is wrong, yeah, it's not wrong. Or is it? Okay, I've ser been searching the documentation for a long while, but couldn't find it, so maybe that's missing. Um, anyway, what we also need is access to the media element, but we always have that, basically. The video player must not use the media element audio source node itself, because that can only be uh, created once per video element. So if a video player would be using uh, the Web Audio API, it had to provide some kind of API where we can inject things into the audiograph. But on the other hand, if he would use Web Audio API, then probably for ambisonics, so, okay. Then another point is we need to detect if an audio track contains ambisonic audio. And I've implemented a small example and for this, I've chosen the BitMovin player because I'm most familiar with that. And it basically looks like this. Like, as a user, you would just create an ambisonics object, pass in a player reference, everything works automatically. But internally, it listens to two events. The onReady event is fired when you load a new source. Then we check if it's a VR source, if there is an ambisonic track, and if yes, we select it. When an audio track is selected or changed, which happens when we select the audio track in the first place. Um, we check again, is it ambisonic? If not, we disable the decoder. If yes, we load and enable the decoder, and the decoder then basically just listens to VR viewing direction events and updates the rotation according to the direction we're looking into. Okay, and in case you're wondering how we detect uh, the ambisonic tracks, we made our life also rather simple here. There's just a role added to the dash manifest, and we use the characteristic stack on the HLS master playlist. But um, last year here at DMAX, there was a talk about the spatial audio RFC, which defines boxes for MP4 
containers with metadata for special audio, which probably makes sense to implement in a production environment, but for our case, this was good enough. And yeah, this implementation is open sourced. It's available on GitHub. You can take a look. It's quite uh, easy to follow. It's just 260 lines of code. Um, it uses Omnitone. There's a demo, which I encourage you to try out with headphones on. And yeah, that's it from my side. I hope you learned something new today. And <laughs> thank you.